currently in Moscow in Russia and I'm gonna take the longest train ride in the world the Trans-Siberian Express and it's going to go from Europe to Asia um, because I want to figure out how to travel sustainable what's the best way to take the bus the train the plane so I committed to myself to make a video on this trip which is gonna take seven days and at the end I should have figured it out So this beautiful train right here is the driving on the Trans-Siberia Railroad Express which goes from west of uh, Russia to the east or the other way around, depends how you go. But it's a super long track, it's over uh, 9000 kilometers. Uh, it takes about 186 hours to complete it, so that's just like 7 full days, 24 hours in the train. So basically a lot of sitting and sleeping, so you have beds in there but also a restaurant. More about that later. So this story actually started about a year ago. Um, because more often for my work I get invited around the world and more often now this is in business class. And um, so in order for this story to understand we need to go back one year where it all started. Let's go! So it's my first time flying business class. I don't think I'm really suited for it. I got holes in my shoes, two different socks, broken pants and some tomato sauce on my shirt. Alright, so this starts off good. Look mom, I'm a priority. I don't have to wait in line like the normal people. And while waiting for my plane, I get some free snacks in a special lounge area. The seats in the plane itself are like transformers. There are buttons and hinges everywhere. Really everywhere. There's enough leg space. This is actually rare for me. I got some free super useful socks, mouthwash and some other stuff. I really needed all of this, says no one ever. But hey, I can chill with a nice tea served in a real ceramic cup. Eat a proper meal with real metal cutlery and watch The Office for the 10,000th time and get some sleep. And there's so much space that I can actually fully lay down. I did not expect that. Man, this is pure comfort. Flying business class is very comfortable. I could literally do this every week. So, fast forward one year later. I couldn't stop thinking about that extra space I used to sleep. Someone could sit there, right? How much more carbon emission does that take extra? Or actually flying in general? And I've been looking into it, so let me explain. Okay, so basically if you travel you use energy and emit carbon in the air. And carbon causes climate change, not cool. So the question is, which transport to choose? Planes, buses, trains or cars? Because they all have a different carbon footprint. Plane the highest and train the lowest. But actually wait, not always. See here's where it already gets a bit more complex. Bear with me, I'll get you through this. Because it depends a lot on your situation. For instance, what type of car you drive, whether you drive alone or together, if the train is powered on diesel or electricity, or whether a plane flies on low or high altitude. Now luckily there is the internet. Not in this train though. Online you can find these carbon calculators that help. You put in your trip, select flight, bus or train and it calculates the amount so you can compare it and take the best option. For instance, this trip to Russia would take me 220 kg of carbon with a train, 900 with a car and 1000 with a flight. And actually, if I would have taken this flight in business class, it would be double, 2000 kg of carbon. Business class takes double the amount of carbon, boom. Now I hear you thinking 2000 kg of carbon is a bit abstract. Now there are also some funny calculators that put it in a bit more perspective. Same thing, you fill in your details, let it think, part. one4 ton of carbon for this trip. And as you might have noticed, this fart calculator shows a different amount of carbon, 1400 kg instead of 1000 kg. And the funny thing is that most calculators actually have quite a different output for the same trip. It's, <laughs> it's actually not funny, it's a bit annoying, it's not accurate at all. And a bit of a nerdy side note I do want to mention, all of them, any tool on the web, only measures the usage, not the full footprint of the trip. For instance, it also requires materials and resources to build the entire infrastructure, build the planes, the road, the railways, and while making and maintaining everything, you also need a lot of energy. So in a way, we should not only compare the usage of each trip, but everything that is needed to make it happen. But okay, okay, let's not go that deep. Okay, so let's say you roughly figured out your carbon emission. Let's say you use 120 kg. Nowadays, you can quite easily offset your footprint by planting some trees. You visit a website, fill in your carbon and they plant, let's say, 10 trees to even it out. And this is a very common practice to do. But unfortunately, the planet doesn't really work like that. But to explain this, we need to go out of the train quickly. 
So when I first heard about this, I was a bit overwhelmed. But I do think it's very interesting to know. And it's also good information next time you're on a party to explain to your friends. So here we have a tree. And to grow a tree, you need to have carbon. So carbon in the air is extracted and the tree uses that mass to grow, which is already kind of magical. So the thinking is, if we emit, let's say 20 kilograms of carbon in the air, we need to make sure we plant a tree. So we compensate the carbon that is usually in the air and compress it into the mass of a tree. However, the fuel and kerosene from transport comes from fossil fuels, which are deep down in the earth and it took them thousands of years to be there. So if you extract them to the surface, we suddenly have a lot of carbon, which wasn't there before. I mean, the carbon was there on the planet, but deep down inside of it, and not on the surface layer, in the air that we all live in and breathe. So we're kind of slowly overdosing our planet with carbon on our surface layer. So growing a new tree to compensate for the old carbon isn't really the same thing. Now, it's still better to plant a tree than no tree. I mean, you still extract carbon out of the air, but I just wanted to make sure that you understand the difference between old and new carbon. So now back into the train. Man, that's a lot to digest. And to be honest, all of this information didn't really make it easier to answer my question on how to travel sustainable. It only got more complex, so many different variables. It makes me more confused. It makes me not want to think about this stuff at all. I'm just not scared. Like, okay, Dave, time for a proper bake. Let's get out. So every time it's a break, they have to chop off all the ice that is on the train. So we're currently halfway in the middle of Siberia in Ukstut. Time to get some fresh air and it seems doable because it's cold. Like really cold. And like many other places in the world, also here they have a big pollution problem. It's called snow. But they have the latest Russian technology to clean it up. But when walking around and zooming out on this topic, I realized the painful truth. I'm looking at it wrong. Because traveling simply takes energy, that's just how it is. I mean, I can maybe try to really find out exactly how much carbon a trip takes and then see if I can hopefully get more efficient. But instead of trying to get a bit more efficient here and there, the biggest win is to not go, to reduce the amount of trips I take. However, nowadays we are always trying to make it cheaper, more comfortable and easier to do. So instead of doing it less, we're actually gonna do it more more often on holidays, meeting friends around the world, having a wedding abroad. And obviously people do it, it's fun. It gets more and more easy. I mean, let's just have a look at my own travel habits. So I travel a lot. Wait, let me actually show you. In the last five years I've been to Cape Town, Kazakhstan, Singapore, Maldives. They actually have the best sticker. Korea, Ghana, India, Malaysia, Thailand. US, Maldives, Brazil, US, Kenya, Nepal, Thailand, Vietnam, Chile, Cambodia, Indonesia, Mexico, Dubai, Kenya, Maldives, Ukraine, and Russia. 
So yeah, many places around the world. And I would say all of them are for work, never for holiday. I'm going to either do a presentation, visit the landfill, do research, make a video. And I would say 95% of these trips, I'm invited. I mean, sure, provide me a free plane ticket and I'll come. It's a bit like giving me delicious candy. Sure, I'll eat it. And especially if you put it here, right next to me in front of my face. Sure, I'll eat it. It's too easy, it's too tempting. I can't control this. And that's where the problem lies, it's too easy. So my approach for traveling is gonna be the same with candy. I need to put it far away. Like somewhere over here. I need to make sure it's not easy to grab, but somewhere more far away. So I can still grab it, but it makes me think twice, a bit more conscious decision making. And I need to do the same with traveling. Try to make it a bit more difficult for myself. So this is what that looks like. So we're currently traveling third class. I'm gonna talk a bit quiet because it's kind of busy here. A lot of people on a square meter. <laughs> so this is my uh, house. It's my bedroom where I sleep. And it's a bit tight, but it works. And let me show you around the rest of the space because it's, it's kind of interesting. So let's start downstairs. So here we have the office area and living room with a good view. Here's the toilet, it's uh, very metallic -y. Funny water tap, only works like this. Never seen that before. Give a few plugs, so you need to share. That is not true. So this is the third class. Now let's go to the second. Your second class, it's much more individual compartments where people sleep. Restaurant. Super exciting. Some snacks. Some drinks. So the restaurant isn't really exciting because they have something which is probably the best thing about this whole train. Let me show you. So here we have the best thing about the train. It's a free hot water supply. So hot water comes out there which you can use to make a nice tea or also porridge in the morning, which I really like to do. Or noodles in the evening, so everyone really uses that thing. And the train feels a bit like a big family. There's this mom of the train that makes sure it's all clean and helps you out. The grandmas are very happy to give you some candy and you can play some games with the kids. Ah, me. Inside the train it's very warm, 24 degrees, so everyone is wearing flip-flops and shorts. And then when you go outside in the night it's minus 25, such a massive difference. And if you ask them how they do it... <laughs> and when I realized making this trip and that it really takes a lot of energy to go to the other side of the world, something I forget when I go by a plane because it's so easy, and this approach makes me very aware of that. It makes me aware that it's not something I should or even want to do every week. It's slow, uncomfortable and just intense. But I would also say it gives a much richer experience. You see more of the country, you have more time to absorb everything and you might meet some funny people along the way. Hello. Hello. Hello from Hello. Russia. Hello from Russia. Yay. Nice. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so made it in Vladivostok. That was a lengthy trip. <laughs> and you can really notice now we're in Asia. It really has this tropical weather. It's minus five instead of minus 17. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I realized I wanted to set a few commitments for myself to make sure I don't just hop on a plane next time. So, commitment number one, the lame one. If I do end up making a flight, I'm gonna compensate it with carbon, but three times the amount. So I'm gonna offset it triple. It's weird that this stuff isn't really mandatory yet. Commitment number two, I'm never ever in my entire life gonna fly business class again. I'm just gonna stick around with the normal people. Commitment number three, within Europe I'm not gonna take any planes anymore. From now on it's just gonna be the train and 32 hour bus rides. Yeah. Now this might seem like a dumb approach to you, but I think it kind of works for me to limit myself and I'm still able to do what I want to do. 
And I would highly recommend to have a look at your own habits as well and see if you can change something in there. Because in an ideal world, we can just travel around and we don't emit any carbon. But realistically, this is not how it is today. Even the aviation industry in itself, so the planes, are planned to double within the next coming 15 years. So that means way more planes, way more carbon and way more fossil fuels. And sometimes it's just better planning or combining trips or maybe taking the train instead of the plane. But I would say try to find that sweet spot where you can still do what you want to do. So you don't have to limit yourself, but you also reduce the amount of carbon in the air. For now, thanks for watching. I'm going to continue my trip in Asia. And if it was a bit nosy, I'm sorry because there's a car road right here. But I just wanted to show this big ass submarine. So see you in the next Story Hopper video. Alright, so if you like this video, I would recommend to watch the fuel of electric cars. It's a video where I go to Chile to visit a lithium mine to see what it takes to drive electric and how much emissions you use with that. Uh, if you didn't like this video at all and hate the topic of transportation, watch this video where we raise a chicken. But overall, many more videos on storyhopper.com.